In this video, we're gonna look at four Japanese cutthroat razors, sharpen one up, and by the end of the video, I'll have lost all this. G'day, welcome to Chestnut Nag. My name's Stuart Chignall. And in an unboxing video I did a little while ago, I pulled out these Japanese cutthroat razors. I said in the introduction that these are 100 year old Japanese cutthroat razors. With vintage tools, it's very hard to be very confident in your dating. And a lot of what you have to base your judgment on is <laughs> very much open to opinion. But having said that, I'm reasonably confident because of one of these razors in particular. And that's it. If you have a look here, it says England Steel. Now, Japan is blessed with many things, but quality iron ore is not one of them. And one of the reasons the Japanese smiths had to get so good is because the raw material that they were working with wasn't so good. Uh, a lot of the iron that they used for making all of their tools and their weapons came from mineralized black sands, which if you want to know more about, you could check out my prospecting channel because we're talking about black sands on that all the time. Problem with mineralized black sands is that they contain a lot of impurities and that's not great for making weapons or for making tools. So when the Japanese society started opening up to the West, one of the things that was high on their list of products to import was quality iron. And the place that they got it from was the UK. Back when the Japanese society was originally first opening up, there was a lot of people a lot of advisors that were employed from uh, the UK, particularly from Scotland. And so naturally, one of the places they sourced materials from was the UK. And that was around the 1880s up until uh, at least the First World War. Uh, nowadays, most iron that is used to, uh, to make tools in Japan comes from Sweden. Now today, with the, a lot of the mythology and uh, over mysticism that's associated with Japanese tools, having England stamped on the steel of a Japanese tool would not be a good marketing technique. But back then, English steel was recognized as superior to the natural Japanese product. And so that was, a, that was very much a mark of quality that the Smith was putting on their blade. Uh, but anyway, it's that detail and a few other things, but that's the main detail that means that I'm placing these at around 100 years old. Let's have a bit of a look at these. Uh, first thing I'll note is that they're all highly polished. These came from a collector and they'd done, uh, well, what they probably called restoration work. Um, but if we look at the, um, the detail of these, you can see that the, um, they've really just, they've just polished them. And you can see that the, see the, the roughness, that the light catching it as I move the razor backwards and forwards, they've really just made them shiny. Um, they haven't made them to be used. In fact, these even, you can see there's chips and the blades aren't, while you could cut yourself with them, they're not really sharp. And, and actually, looking closely underneath the, um, the macro lens, you can see all sorts of little details on there which don't show when you're just showing them, you know, when they're just looking there, like lying there, like nice and shiny. Now, because I'm not a collector, I have to decide which of these to keep. So even here, you've got some pretty serious pitting that has been polished and that's um yeah not a great look and even even say look, the polish hasn't lasted and look, you've got rust forming on there that's interesting detail and look at that that's often a thing when you're trying to restore a tool is trying to discern what is the original intent of the smith what is the intent of the previous owner assuming the previous owner knew what they were doing and what is any sort of damage from you know, people restoring things who didn't have a clue what they were doing. But if we look here, you can see that there's grind marks on the upper blade, but then there's a polished area. And I don't mean a polished area from the previous owner who's just buffed these things to buggery, but that looks like an, a ground area where the, scra the original smith marks have been removed. 
And so it looks like there is a slight back bevel on this blade. If we look at the other side, you've got long, you've got scratches going the other way, the length of the blade rather than across the blade. And I'm not sure I can see a similar area that's been given a bevel. That almost looks like a flat. Let's see if we can see the same detail on the other ones. Well, that's interesting. See that lap? There's a forge welded lamination in that. It looks like this was actually more corroded. If you see those pits there that have been polished. What about the other side? And here we've got those same longitudinal lines running the length of the blade and no visible bevel on this side. And so I'm wondering, if you see here, there's that flattened section. I'm wondering if that is meant to be the flat, you know, a slight line of steel just there and there. And that this whole area on the razor here is sort of looks like, acts like the ura on a Japanese chisel. It means that this side is the side that gets the bevel. But I, from this one, I can't see the detail enough. It's, it, uh, it, looks, it looks like it was too corroded and then it was you know, polished to buggery by the previous owner, by the collector. Now, what do we got here? Well, let's look at the, again, you've got that flattened edge on the back, no visible bevel there. Also, again, the longitudinal scratches, they all seem to have that. And on the back, we, oh, we've got longitudinal scratches. And that does look like the remains of a bevel just there. Oh, look at that. Look at that forge weld coming through there. I'm not sure, I hope the camera is picking that up. You can just see that change in the structure of the steel. Just the tone of it, the color tone of it. So now for the last one, which is the one that's stamped English steel. So again, we've got that flat at the back. Quite a lot of pitting there. And again, that looks like the bevel. There is definitely a bevel there. So since all four of them seem to have that features, it looks like we got a pretty safe bet is that the flat is on the stamped, marked, branded side. And then there's a bevel there's a slight, a very, very acute bevel on the back. I said before that in a modern context, the England English steel isn't a marketing point. And it's probably a, a detraction from people who want to sanctify the craft of a, you know, the Japanese smith. So I think of these four blades, and since I'm not collector, which means I can't keep all four, I think the one that I'll sharpen to keep and use will be the one that has England steel on it. And then you guys can buy the ones that don't have England on it for, yeah, for more money. Oh, I'm sorry, that was really insulting. What I meant to say was that I'd put them on eBay and that some hipster Katana fanboy who gets all entangled in the emotional ideology of the superiority of stuff just because it's Japanese would pay more for them. Whereas you guys are more sensible more logical and will you assess a tool on its merits not superficial stuff that's what i meant to say so plan of attack well we've got to get rid of at least some of the pits on what i'm going to call the flat or the branded side of the of the razor once we've done that then we can start thinking about putting a very very acute bevel on the back on oh, look actually it almost looks like there's a double error here i'll go back to the the macro just notice this catching the light. But do you see there's that flat area there and the flat area there and then it's polished there? Do the others have the others? The others don't have that. That one doesn't. Oh, that one does. Interesting. Actually, maybe, maybe this one does have it. I was just looking at it wrong. Maybe, maybe it does. Hmm. I think that's one of those things that we're gonna to have to see what the scratch pattern looks like after we've uh, start sharpening. So to start with, we're gonna see what an 800 grit uh, king stone looks like. I just better check it's flat. 
Yep, good. That means I, I flattened it up after the last time we used it. Okay, so we start with the back. Now, if you see here, there's this this bevel action here and this flat flat area here. I'm going to try and see if that if that area there kind of works as a flat and and that as an ura. And we'll see how we go. You know, I've never sharpened a cutthroat razor before. So a few strokes. Oh, that looks, yeah, that, look at that. See, that comes up really nicely. But look at all that pitting that we're going to have to deal with there. I'm not even sure we're going to be able to sharpen that properly because that pitting is so deep. But yeah, it looks like that works as an ura. You've got that hollowed section, you've got, and you've got two areas that give you a reference face, two points that give you a reference face to get the bevel right to sharpen. So this side looks like it's going to be technically pretty easy, but it looks that maybe physically demanding because there's a lot of steel we're going to have to remove to get that deck back to flat. And it might not be possible. Let's see how we go. And this is this is one of the you know immediate problems you can have with tools especially when you're buying them from collectors rather than users, is that the person who has polished this to make it pretty has put a pretty substantial um, back bevel on this. And you can see that polished area that the Kingstone isn't getting to. Now, we could grind that out by working on the, the bevel on the other side, but that, that's a lot of steel to lose just there. And since we don't have a continuous line of flat steel there I think we still keep going with the king until we get rid of more of those pits and then we'll start working on the other side unfortunately it's a really common thing with a lot of tools secondhand tools is that uh, people get them and they immediately try and fix them without having a clear idea of what they're doing now I've never done a razor before but that's why I looked at every single razor to see what common features there were and trying to, to just have a, an idea of what's the difference between damage and what's the difference between wear and what's the difference between intention from the Smiths. Because while I might not know razors at all, I do know blades. And while I'm no master, you know, I have got a fair bit of experience. And that's really just stuff I've picked up from asking questions and making mistakes. Hmm. Okay. Well, there's still there's still a lot of um, pits in this, and I'm gonna have to take off a lot of metal to get rid of them. So what I might do before I get overzealous is I might check what putting a bevel on the other side looks like and what that does to the configuration of the blade. Because if a bevel on the other side might fix some of the problems without me having to remove as much metal as I otherwise would. All right, now on the other side, it's gonna be very hard for me to um, film this, but you see there's that flat on the left there and there's no corresponding flat on the right. Now, if I tilt this up, you see there's quite a curve to that. So that leads me to believe that there is no bevel on this side. In fact, I don't think there's meant to be a bevel on either side. I think actually, wow, that's, that's, that, is, that is fabulous. So what I think is meant to happen is that you have the Ura on both sides which guides how you sharpen the blade and you don't need to think about what angle the bevel should be or anything like that. I just think you, you just work both sides until you bring an edge, which means I might need to move an awful lot of steel off the back. Now let's see how this side sharpens up. I might need to remove a lot of steel off both sides. Well, 
that's a bugger because if we go hard we're going to go into the stamps and that's not a good idea mind you that is a cosmetic thing and a collector's consideration and i'm a user not a collector so it's not something i should factor into my thinking uh, that's a pretty deep set of pits there though all right let's go got to put more pressure on on the blade on the edge side this time all right we can see i'm starting to get a clear line of metal across there lots of pits but that's not a sharp that's not an edge so we don't care about that so much but look starting to get a clear line there as well and again pits and chips so i think we've got a clear plan now i've just got to work both sides until i get an edge hmm right well here you can see oh, part of the problem is that the for want of a better term the ura on this side is disappearing and i've still got quite a secondary bevel there that i've got to get rid of and pits and at this end even a, a chip on the other side i'm really starting to get into the into the stamp which is unfortunate but if you get if look, this is the thing i'm not a collector so i use tools and if that means that some of the features get lost well say la vie um but i'm not happy about it so what i think i'm going to do is i'm going to focus on the stamp side but i'm going to focus my finger pressure on the edge itself this will, this will take more material away from the edge rather than the back and that will increase the angle at which the two planes come together making it a more obtuse angle. it won't make it less sharp because sharpness has nothing to do with the angle of the bevels or the planes intersection um, a level of sharpness is how crisply the two planes come together angle completely separate discussion so I think by increasing the angle as much as I can by increasing the pressure that I put on the blade as I'm sharpening that will uh, mean that I'll get to preserve more of the branding and also get rid of the the chips and the back brevel as quickly as possible I just hope this isn't a you know a genuine collector's piece that would be bad. Well, I think that's enough of the roughing and we're now into the genuine sharpening. Now you see I've changed the angle at which I'm holding it to the stone. That way I should get a cross hatch of scratch marks. And when that cross hatching disappears and I've just got, well now in this case, I've just got uh, diagonal scratches I know I'm completely done with this stone. And then I can move on to the next. And then I'll go back to doing a perpendicular scratch pattern, which I then you know, I'll know what I've got rid of that when I've got rid of all the diagonals. Yep. And then I'll go back to then I'll go back to holding the razor perpendicular to the stone, and I'll know that I'm finished with that stone when I've got only perpendicular scratches. You can only see diagonal scratches there oh, but look at that look at the texture of the steel coming out that the forged lamination there how it's responding differently to this oh this pit still damn 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 that's coming up pretty well that's a good crisp clean edge except for just there but i still i think we can forgive it that what are we looking at the back there's a few pits that are close to the edge there for wood it wouldn't matter oh the, look at those pits they will matter they're what's in, in a razor they're what you call uh hair pullers a lot of people uh when they're they're testing a blade will shave arm hair with it and if, if it can shave arm hair, it's probably good enough for wood. 
but it's not really sharp. Shaving arm hair is really, really easy. If you want to test a blade is really sharp, sharp and shave your beard because the sensitivity of your skin, the toughness of your whiskers means that uh, you feel if it's not really super sharp. And trust me, a blade that is sharp enough to sharpen arm hair isn't anywhere near sharp enough to, sh to shave your beard. All right. Yeah? What, what can I do for you? Nothing, I just wanted to watch. And when are we going to finish the, um, the roof for the saw? What Morag's talking about is I've just been building a outdoor uh, workbench for my sliding compound motor saw. Something I've been wanting to do for ages and events have forced my hand to make it happen right now. But, you know, that'll be in another video. Mm, that's looking pretty good. Or well, at least I think it's as good as it's going to be without taking off a lot more metal, which I really don't want to do at this point. Now, before you do anything with the finishing stones, you need to make sure your blade is really, really clean. You don't want any grit from the kings going onto the finishing stones. And I need to give this a blast under water because I've got kingstone mud in the stampings. You've still got a diagonal scratch pattern there, which means I haven't gone on off with this stone. Lucky. It's looking pretty good on this side though, but you do have... Mm, oh, yeah, there's pits on the edge. Yeah, that's going to pull. Okay, so that's better. We're down to just perpendicular scratches now. I'll get rid of that last little bit of mud there, and then we'll uh, go to the last stone. And it's looking pretty good. There's a few little nicks in the blade there still, from pits. Some major ones there. But... Is it going to be good enough? That's the question. What are you eating, Lucky? Now, having said that testing on arm hair is, is you know, no real test at all. Yeah, I don't think that's sharp enough. You can see it's, it's doing a great job. That's cleared all that hair off my arm really quite easily. But it also scratched me a little bit, so I think we need to keep going. Having said that it might not be, it wasn't good enough. I haven't done the, um, I haven't done the single stroke from side, from back to front yet. So let's do that. One, two, three, ten. All right. Oh yes. Much better. That's just gliding through. All right. All right, now, last finishing thing I do on my blades when I'm going to be shaving with them especially is um, it's sort of like a stropping technique. I don't know if they would have used this for Japanese razors. I believe this is what they did with cut... I believe they did use a strop with cutthroat razors, English Western-style cutthroat razors. But a technique I have did, I started doing a while ago, and it seems to work really well, is I actually use my hand as the strop. Now I said at the start of this video that at the end of it you'd be get to see the razor in action on me. But I think given the level of detail that I went into in first examining the razors and then through the sharpening process, I reckon I'm going to do that in the second video um, because that will have a completely different tone and you'll get to see Sarah, see Sarah and I um, come to words. Won't we, Morag? Yeah, probably. So some people find those funny. Um, I certainly find them funny, which is why I do those videos because they're a lot of fun. But anyway, uh, I will catch you in that video, which will be coming out very, very shortly. And um, like, 
I won't I won't publish this video until that next video is ready to go. So I'll, I'll publish it, you know, within a day or two of you seeing this one. So hope you found this interesting, and uh, stay tuned to see what it how it performs, and how much you know Sierra cuts me. Catch you guys later. Bye bye. Yeah, polishing with the the finishing stone really brings out the pits, makes them easier to see. And I'll need to clear a bit more mud off that, but that looks pretty good. Looks pretty good.